Hello, I'm Rithula Shah, and this interview is part of a series from the Imperial War Museum Institute's Reimagining Victory series, which is to mark the 75th anniversary of VE Day this year. It's made in partnership with the peace-building non-governmental organisation Conciliation Resources. What we're hoping to do is try to investigate the connections between past conflict, our history, and the world we live in now. And Martin Griffiths, who we'll hear from in a moment, is only too familiar with a brutal conflict that's playing out today. He's a diplomat and currently serving as the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, a role he's played since February 2018. Welcome, Martin Griffiths. <laughs> Yemen has been at war since 2014. Around 10,000 people have been killed and millions have lived in the midst of this ongoing humanitarian conflict. Uh, the roots lie in the Arab Spring of 2011 when Yemen's longtime ruler was forced out and there was supposed to be a political transition uh, with Abdraba Mansour Hadi taking power. Instead, there's been war and turmoil. I'm going to leave actually the details of this conflict to you, but bearing all that in mind, for you in the context of Yemen, what does reimagining victory mean? I think it means having a clear uh, vision of what a Yemen could look like again. Um, victory, I think, is not a word we use very much in peacemaking, but it would be synonymous with peace and a sustainable peace and a return as one Yemeni um, diplomat once put it to me, a return to civility. So it's having the vision of that, of the prospect of that for the people of Yemen and uh, working of course towards it, but also injecting hope into the efforts to achieve that vision. So victory would be something that is achievable war is something that doesn't need to go on indefinitely as it seems to to all of those who are caught up in it i'm interested in this idea that victory is not a word you use in diplomacy why is that well i think in the in the in the world of mediation and peacemaking um and internal civil wars which is the the bulk of the conflicts that people like me deal with. Uh, military victory, because victory is associated with military victory, is very rare, very, very rare. And the absolute uh, common feature of these internal conflicts is that the war runs out of steam, that the leaders in war turn their efforts to resolving their differences, perhaps with help of the UN and elsewhere conciliation resources. And that what we achieve is peace because vi victory suggests that one side has won and the other side has lost. And the wars that I have been dealing with for the last 40 years, it should be a win-win, not a win-lose. So a very important, in a sense, subtle definition between peace and victory there. Let's talk about Yemen then specifically. The f alarming thing, the striking thing about the conflict in Yemen has been the involvement of outside forces, of international actors. How important have they been and how crucial are they to the peace, to the reimagined victory? Yes, I think they are absolutely central to that. Yemen is one of those conflicts which has the bad luck for uh, for the people of Yemen to be, I guess, what I would call a strategic conflict, which is one which is the outcome of which or the process of which or the issues that affect the war are of real interest outside the country. So it's not just a domestic matter. Yemen has never been a domestic conflict, even though it has uh, you know, a great deal of domestic enmity. And therefore, uh, we have had these external interests, incidentally, including Europe, because the uh, shipping lanes which go by Yemen up to uh, the Suez Canal and into Europe are right next to Yemen's 
uh, coast and Yemen's territory. And one of the worries that we've often had in Europe is whether those shipping lanes would be become involved in the war. So there are external interests. There are some much closer in the region, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and so forth. And there are some further afield. And that's why the United Nations is directly involved. And that's why the UN Security Council, those 15 member states, are directly involved. And I brief them every 30 days on the business of ending this conflict in Yemen. What do you think are the biggest obstacles to peace right now in Yemen then? I think they, the, it, 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 I think, oddly enough, and I hope it's true, I believe it's true, I think these external interests are actually converging on the need to resolve the conflict and end the war. I think we now have a geopolitics, if I put it that way, which favors uh, resolving this conflict and ending the shooting war first and then getting on with building peace. I think those interests are aligned. We have a United Security Council. Regional interests want this to happen for all kinds of reasons. So the, uh, the, the issue affecting our daily efforts to try to, first of all, bring about a ceasefire and then a political solution on the back of that is to make sure that what we introduce and what are agreed between the Yemeni parties, that is the governor of Yemen on the one hand, and the Houthi movement, Ansarallah, on the other, uh, suit their interests. In other words, it's a negotiation that needs those two uh, movements or a government and a movement to agree on the essential components, first of all, of a ceasefire, and then on a power sharing agreement. In other words, the issues that drove Yemen to conflict in the first place have got to be resolved through dialogue instead of through war. Uh, and this is the focus now, that we need to help those Yemeni parties come to terms with those obligations. We need the external influence, efforts, prodding, support to get them to that right place. And I believe we can do that, and I believe we can get there. I don't know if, if there's a specific that you can point to in this conflict. What changes that scenario? This is a conflict that has been going since 2014. I'm going to very crudely paint it in. You, you've been much more subtle already, but it's basically pitted the rebel Shia Houthis, who have some support from Iran, against a coalition led by Saudi Arabia and a mostly Sunni Arab state. But uh, the US, the UK, France, we've all played our part. Uh, what's changed? Why is there a willingness? Is there an exhaustion or is it is there another geopolitical factor that perhaps has made everybody think this is futile? I think there are a number of factors and it's the lucky convergence of the factors which give a chance for, for peace, for ending the war. I think the first thing is that the war has pretty well run its course. Um, on the whole, and there are exceptions to this, on the whole, the taking of territory, which is a, obviously an essential component of a military campaign, uh, has uh, petered out, if I may put it that way, in the last year or so. Uh, as I was told once by some military planners from uh, an international, um, another government, that there isn't any real likelihood of uh, significant territory being taken. So the military efforts have pretty well run their course. We managed to prevent a, a battle for Hodeida, one of the big ports on the Red Sea, about uh, 18 months ago. And so far, I think we've prevented a similar effort on an eastern province of Yemen, which is the oil-rich province of Maru. So that's the first thing. The second thing, is, I think, is that if, if you see no prospect of a military victory, you tend to check your other options if you are a sponsor. And the other options have become clearer and clearer. That's my job, of course, to put them in front of the people. And the the third thing is that, um, you know, the world cannot afford this kind of conflict to go on indefinitely. The reputational risk to those involved, and we've seen it in the West as well as in the region, is significant and has increased. And the cost, just the financial cost of running this war is uh, very significant indeed. So it's, move, it's getting those uh, connections together, fed up with the war, seeing a possible political solution that in a third way meets your interests, interests of stability in the region. Connect those three and we may get a chance of resolving it. Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, 
who worked on Syria, the UN, uh, in 2012, said famously, you need to align the three circles in a war. The internal circle, which is the interests of the people, the second circle, which is those of the region, and the third circle, which is the governments of the international community represented by the council. When you get those stars lined up, you get a chance. And the chance is to give the parties in Yemen the opportunity to decide how to end this war and not be dictated to by those outside circles. In a sense, there's a question of nobody losing face, is a, is a more blunt way of putting that. Yes, indeed, it, it, it is. Everybody has to win. I remember when I first met the leader of the Houthi movement, um, Sarala movement, Abdul Malik al Houthi, first time I met him was in Sana two years ago. And I said, You do realize, don't you, that the other side is going to have to win this war? It's important for their respect. And he said, Of course, I understand that. And I hope they understand that I have to win it too. So, you know, the art of the media, mediation is to try to suggest that everybody, by doing the right thing, by responding to the needs of their people, uh, will benefit. Now, we're having this conversation at the beginning of June 2020, but in May, the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in Yemen. What impact do you think the pandemic has had on the course of the conflict and perhaps on the, the, the push for peace? I think it's really complicated, uh, as you can imagine. First of all, the impact of the virus, and we haven't seen it, haven't seen the, 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 we haven't got to the top of the curve yet. The United Nations estimates that we'll probably get there in July uh, is devastating, as predicted. Yemen has, has a broken down health system at best, uh, and it's a divided country. Uh, so the virus is, is going viral. And it's uh, having an, ex an, an extreme impact on the, on, of course, on the people of Yemen. It is also having an impact on their leaders. And uh, we see it in the negotiations that I hold, uh, you know, every day with the leaders, for example, at the Houthi movement. The turmoil that they've been going through to try to determine how they're going to respond to this, how they're going to be accountable for this in terms of their people, how they can blame somebody else for it. So that's actually affected our negotiations, not necessarily in a good way. On the other side of the of the of the the balance here is that we appeal the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed, as you know, in March, globally for a ceasefire to allow the people in conflict countries to address the virus as opposed to carry on their war. This provides a narrative. This provides a not a cover story, but a reason for these warring parties to knock it off and to face the real scourge, which is, uh, you know, decimating their people. So there is, there is there's something to be said about that. There is something to be said that that could uh, be, a, be, a, be a benefit. We certainly employed that in Yemen as part of our potential agreement, but we need to get there quickly. The, uh, conducting a war and a multi-faceted, many, many battlefields in Yemen while you're trying to fight the virus is a kind of unpardonable nightmare for the people of Yemen. You've reframed the idea of reimagining victory in, in terms of peace. Just though, before we, we come to the end of this conversation, what has this meant that the process, what has it meant for the people of Yemen? It has been a truly terrible conflict as far as civilian suffering is concerned. It has been absolutely appalling and in a ghastly way, as is so often the case of these conflicts, it's been an unnecessary war. Um, and the people of Yemen, as ever, have been the victims of this. As you know, one of the worst things of these internal conflicts is that it takes a generation to recover and to reconcile between communities. I'm not talking about leaders. I'm not talking about uh, trials in The Hague. I'm talking about communities living side by side with those with whom they've been at war. This process of reconciliation, which is local at its most important, is going to be the big challenge for Yemen. Of course, there'll be reconstruction. Of course, there'll be power sharing uh, if we are lucky enough to get a, a political settlement 
that the process of reconciliation and the process of re-establishing links, trade links, infrastructure, um, schooling for kids who haven't been to school for five years, that's actually the software of war and the software of peace. Those are the things that take time and all that people like me can do and the outside world can do um, is give Yemen a chance, give the people of Yemen a chance to get back to where they want to be, because there's no doubt about where that is. So bearing in mind everything that you've told us and where you are now in terms of negotiations, are you optimistic then in the immediate term that, that there can be peace in Yemen? I think we can, with some confidence, uh, predict that we can end the war within the near future. This is what I've been focusing our UN negotiations on in the last 10 weeks of this lockdown COVID-19 period. I think we could be fairly confident of a nationwide ceasefire. I think so. My hope is the currency of the mediator, as you know, so hope is part of, you know, our, our bread and butter. Building peace, resolving the issues that divide the Yemeni political parties is going to be the next challenge. And we hope that we'll be able to build towards that on the basis of a Yemen which is not, uh, which has opened up its economy, which has not got a blockade affecting its uh, the success of its humanitarian aid programs, which can confront the virus, and which in which people aren't being shot at every day as they go to take their kids to school. So we hope to create a new environment for the real task, which is to get a political solution on the back of that, build back towards peace. I think Yemen, among the conflicts in the Middle East, has the best prospects for this. But uh, let us not underestimate the power of people to block those hopes. Martin Griffiths, UN Special Envoy to Yemen, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for inviting me.